scripture say <clears throat> that uh, it's not a matter that we love him. Why wouldn't we love him? The real thing to stop and ponder is why does he love us? But he does. He loves us to the point that he gave his own life on Calvary for us. He loves us this morning. Miss Terry, last Sunday morning we talked about what a blessing it was to have a church family in times like what last week was. That we're all going to experience heartache and failure and discouragement and death. <clears throat> but uh, the, great, the great difference being when we have a church family that comes around us and loves on us and and I thank you as a church that you do a great job of doing that and continue to pray for, for Miss Terry. <clears throat> I don't know why my uh, voice, seems like it's always when I get up to preach or what are y'all wanting, shorter sermons or something and that, I mean, that's not working too well is it Miss Nancy? Just can't, just can't seem to get them down there, thank you Gina. <clears throat> be over there singing just fine and get up here and my voice go crazy. <clears throat> As you know, we're in chapter 17 of Revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christos, the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I've entitled the message this morning two ways. <clears throat> Great songs that Dave and Becky, or more precisely, I think, Becky picked out this morning and David led. I'd rather have Jesus. Because there's two ways. We can either love Jesus and we can come together as a body of Christian brothers and sisters and what most of the world says is just a waste of time this morning. But we're here this morning because... We don't believe it's a waste of our time. We, we're doing what the Bible tells us to do, to assemble together for mutual encouragement, for mutual edification, that we read the Word of God together. And I know you've probably heard it said, you may not, you may not really use or find relevant every word of every message every Sunday. But a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, you may need exactly what you're going to hear this morning uh, for an encouragement for you. And so that's why we come, first day of the week, we come together for mutual encouragement around what we believe to be the authority here on earth, God's word uh, to us this morning. Two ways, and there's just two ways. There's the way of the cross, or there's the way of the devil. There's Cain and Abel, or there's the two thieves on the cross, or there's so many other multiple illustrations throughout Scripture where there's two ways. The psalmist writes in Psalms chapter 1, a passage that uh, many of you have put to memory, <clears throat> Psalms chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of, of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. He's walking, and then he stands, and then he sits. It's a progression that the godly don't do this. They don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, or stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. So it's, it's not just him walking on his own, but he's delighting in God's word. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So the godly is prospering. In verse 4, there's six verses in this first psalm. Three to the godly, three to the ungodly. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the 
chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous for the Lord knows the way of the righteous but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So there's the way of the godly man that God blesses and there's the way of the ungodly man that God's going to judge and he's going to perish. And Jesus said in Matthew 7, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many go by it. But narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. The two ways, it's represented all through Scripture, in fact, uh, like I said, from Adam and Eve on, from, the, from, from, Cain and Abel, from Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, even the days of the flood, you either got on the ark or, or you didn't get on the ark. You either believed God or you didn't believe God. In that same setting in Matthew 7 where Jesus talked about the, the two ways, he ends that subject, and that's the, the final um, Part of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, what I say is the greatest sermon ever preached. Pretty short, but it's very much to the point. Jesus preaching this message. He ends it with the wise man built his house on the rock. And the foolish man built his house on the sand. Two ways. When the storms of life come, when the rains come, the house on the rock stood firm. The house on the sand collapsed. And Jesus uses that comparison to talk about the godly and the ungodly. The godly man, the wise man, seeks after God, builds his house on the rock. The ungodly man seeks after the fame and fortune in the world. And he's not going to, he, first of all, he's not going to find what he thinks he's looking for, what his, what his heart cries out for, he'll never find in the world. I think I can also highlight this in what Jesus said, or what the Bible says in Luke 5, 11. The disciples were all on the boat. It says, when they brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him as opposed to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. So you hear the word of God, and you step out of the boat, and you follow him, because that's the way. Where Jesus said, I'm the <clears throat> way, the truth, and the life. <clears throat> He's the only way. He's the only life. He's the only way the life and the truth he's the only truth everything else is a lie and I think ultimately we can sum it up when God gave Moses the first commandment we go all the way back to Exodus chapter 20 and God in no uncertain words told, no, told Moses to write I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods, little g, gods before me. Two ways. It's always been two ways. You believe God, big G, big capital G-O-D, Yahweh, the one true and living God, or you chase after the gods of the world, thinking that in them you don't find Whatever's missing in your life, whether it's happiness, and usually it's happiness, health, comfort, whatever it is that, that you think you need, that you will chase after, and never will that which you're chasing after meet the longings and the need of your heart. Thus, Revelation chapter 17 where in the King James Bible it says it's the great whore. The other translations call it the prostitute or the, or the harlot. And it's always been either the pure lamb, the bride, 
of Christ, chaste, ready to be presented to, to God, to Jesus as his bride, or just to be frank, and this is the words of the Bible, the beast and his whore. That's the two ways that this world presents it to us. And what is the one thing about a prostitute that makes her a prostitute? You pay her. And so we pay more ways than we can know and believe when we chase after the things of the world, thinking that in her we don't find something and we might get five minutes of pleasure or whatever and, and that's maybe guilt-ridden and, and with all kinds of strings attached and it, yet it never brings what we're chasing after. And yet it cost us so much of the time everything when God is over here offering us exactly what we need free of charge if we just come to him and believe it. Now, isn't that a contrast? <laughs> I think we can all understand that contrast. And that's exactly what John is bringing to our attention in Revelation chapter 17, the, the two ways. Maybe I don't talk about my own illustrations or my own life enough. Some preachers talk about themselves all the time. I, I, he, I hesitate. I usually go the other way. But it just struck me in, in reading through this and the fact that um, my kids and grandkids were with us. It seemed like they might as well move in with us. We're with them or they're with us. But their air conditioner went out in Texas, and uh, you know how hot it's been. And with a newborn three-week-old baby uh, and $10,000 they've got to come up with to get a new, complete new system. They just come spent a week with us. But a couple of weeks ago, we spent uh, four or five days in Flower Mound, and my son from Seattle, uh, when he comes in, they'd rather just rent a house instead of a hotel or whatever. And so most of us just went over and stayed with them. Two bigger boys, we call them the BBs now since there's four of them, the big boys. So the BBs was over with us, and we rented a pool, and Aaron Michelle was in, and then Jennifer, our single daughter, was there. We all stayed in the, in the hotel, or in the rent, just a house with a big pool, and Jessica and David and the two little, the 18-month-old the and the infant came over nearly every minute. But my kids just enjoy being together. My kids love each other. And I couldn't have searched the world over and found two better in-laws that fit our, our family. David worked with me up on the farm yesterday. Just, we just had a big time, enjoyed being together. And the two bigger boys came up later, and we rode the four-wheeler and had a newborn calf, Miss Nancy, so we just got to go out and look. And, but God called me to preach back in the, in the 70s. I didn't surrender till midway through the, through the 80s. And I fought that tooth and nail. I just, I was actually, and I am an introvert. I'll just stand back and let everybody else talk, and then I'll talk. But then I, when I get to the podium, I don't know when to shut up, I guess, so I just keep on talking. But I remember when I finally said yes, I just said, I literally just held my hands up to God and said, God, to the best of my ability, I'm just giving in to you. I'll, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything. Uh, I just want to preach your word and serve you. And that's been quite a journey. And we don't have a lot of money in the bank. God makes people, God, God says preachers ought to be humble, and then you put deacons there to make sure that they are. You know, that's, a, that's what I've been told. But we've got good deacons around here. But we've just never had, you know, the ministry doesn't pay most preachers big money. Um, but I don't lack for anything this morning. In fact, that's the, my whole point. I probably have what 
most of the world would kill or steal to have. That is a family that will come together and just love being together. And just bub, 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 bub. A thousand times a day I hear bub. And I get those kids up and we just talk and they're learning memory verses and a three and a five year old can probably quote as many verses as most of you can. Uh, I mean, just teaching them the things of the word and then talking about sharks and, <laughs> and whatever. Just There's two ways in the world. We can either chase after the world and thinking getting more, 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 we're going to have more. <laughs> and we just don't. And we see this just in a great way. I mean, we just see the, the exclamation point put on it in Revelation 17. So look with me, verse 1, Revelation 17. And one of the seven angels, remember we've just talked about the seven bowls and the seven wraths of uh, God being poured out on an unregenerate world, and how even the angels said... Uh, Worthy are you, O Lord, for what you've done. You're, you're just in what you've done. And then, so now one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, and I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. All through Scripture, this this terminology of the adulterer or the, or the King James, the, the whore, the harlot, the prostitute, is always used because we understand it. We understand in our humanity how, how detrimental, how, how harmful, I mean, how devastating those sexual sins are when they come into a marriage. And, and in Scripture, God's people are to be married to God. And when we chase after the gods of this world, we're committing spiritual prostitution, spiritual whoredom, the Bible talks about. And over and over, I mean... Man, you do a search, you'll just find it all through the, the Bible that God uses this kind of analogy. And he says, come, I'm going to show you the judgment of the, of the great harlot or of the, the great whore. Mega, not just a, but the great harlot who sits on many waters. So... Rest assured, we've got a lot of imagery going right going on here, but boy, it's profound. With whom the kings of the earth. So now we've got a great harlot, and now we've got kings. So we've got two different groups we're speaking of. We're speaking of great power, uh, authority, prestige, wealth. We've got these kings of the earth who committed fornication. That's interesting, too. Fornication is not a marital term. It's uh, more of a term always used. It could be a general term, but it's usually used outside of marriage. So these kings are not God's people. These kings are not committing spiritual adultery in the sense that, that Israel or that you and I as Christians who are, in that sense, married to God or as in Israel are with us betrothed to be the bride of Christ to one day yet marry the Lord Jesus. That's the picture that Paul gives us. But we've got this great harlot, and the Bibles don't tell us in, in 17 in a minute that these many waters are many peoples, so we don't have to guess this great harlot's uh, coming from all these peoples of the world with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth. So now here's the third bunch. Here's everybody. Here's the inhabitants of the earth. And they were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now that's a mouthful. But as we look around our world at just 
chaos and a lot of times stupidity. How do drunk people act? Could we say stupid? And the world is acting stupid because they've drunk the wine of the harlot and they're not following after godly principle. Two ways. Either godly principle or principles of the harlot of this world drinking what he says been made drunk so they're inebriated with the wrong kind of thinking ungodliness as we read in Psalms chapter 1 so in verse 3 so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman it doesn't mean that women are more apt to sin than men are. It's just the analogy that we see that God is the Father. And when we look at this, uh, how that uh, he's using this comparison, he says, And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So she's riding this beast. In other words, using the beast. The beast is her beast of burden, so to speak, at this point in time. And this is the same beast that come up out of the, the abyss that John talked about earlier. This is the Antichrist. So this harlot's pretty, pretty powerful. This harlot is riding this scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. And that just means that this whole world system that's against God, that we're our own gods. That's why we have Ten Commandments, is that you can't do these things and, 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 and be a follower uh, of God. You certainly can't do the first one. You have all these other gods. So he's full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So we had that earlier. We've already seen this beast with seven heads and ten horns. In fact, I came over and read part of this passage in 17 when we had it earlier, because just a moment he's going to explain to us what the seven heads and the ten horns are all about. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. So here's a woman who's been called the great harlot, riding the, the, the beast, the Antichrist, with seven heads, ten horns, and she is decked out, we'll say, with all that the world has to offer, is, is the picture. She's got the gold, she's got the glitz and the glamour, the whole world has sought her out, and she's got everything this world has for bringing you peace and prosperity and happiness from their perspective, and she's holding a cup from which she's drinking from, you know, you assume that, it's a cup, and it's full of the abominations and the filthiness of her godless uh, life. And on her forehead, a name written. All right. Brother David, you want to come explain this? Uh, you, you know, there's just nothing here that's hard in, the, in Revelation to understand, but mystery is part of her name. That's not just a title. That's part of her name, mystery. Mystery Babylon the Great. And, boy, it matters what we do with this name. And it, it's all over the spectrum on what people think and believe uh, we're talking about here. The mother, so now we're talking about a mother. Usually we talk about mothers in good, good terms, but this is the, the madam, the mother of all harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So who are we talking about? We're not just talking about Babylon, Iraq. We're not just talking about a, a particular place. Uh, Babylon was a great city. Nebuchadnezzar ruled over the world from Babylon 
But Babylon gets its name from what we're going to study in just a week or two in the book of Genesis from the, the time of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel was built because mankind wanted to build them a, a, a tower into heaven, not so they could worship God, but so they could replace God. Mankind wanted to be God. And mankind also did not scatter on the earth like God had told them to do, but they all stayed together. And in staying together, they thought they were invincible. They thought they could do whatever they wanted to do. And God at the Tower of Babel sent confusion. And that's what Babel means is confusion. To Babylon, we get that, uh, we use that term yet today. And Babylon, the city, comes from that same uh, name in the same part of the world. May have been the exactly same place where the Tower of Babel was that later becomes Babylon. But ba Babylon represents something in Scripture far more than just this uh, place. It, it represents everything that mankind is trying to do to thwart God's plan. It's, uh, it's, the, it's the other way. It's the, it's the epitome of the other way. It's this harlot riding this beast, and on her forehead is written this name, Babylon the Great. It's everything in this world that's uh, against God and against Christianity and against godliness. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of, of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Something really got, we don't see this. This is the only place we see it where John just was like, he's already been almost uh, without words. But at this point, it's like he maybe took a step back. And his eyes were big and his mouth, wow. Something just jumped out about this whole thing to John that was, that, mar that caused him to marvel with great amazement when he saw what he saw. And the angel said to me in verse 7, Why did you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. Now, I think it was in 13, we've already read about him coming out of the bottomless pit. But remember, John is not giving us revelation in a complete sequential uh, conversation. He's throwing things at us like right now. Uh, chapter 17 uh, actually is, is part of chapter 16 because chapter 16 ends with and it's finished. So the seven bowls finished it. But John is now giving us more information about what the seven bowls really meant and uh, the wrath of God being poured out. And so uh, it's, uh, we, we just get a little piece and then a part of the story and a little piece and it jumps back and forth. So we've already seen this beast come up out of the bottomless pit. And so John is now uh, reiterating that where he says the beast that carries her I'll tell you the mystery of the beast that carries her. The beast you saw was and is not and will ascend. Well, he, he has as far as the record and revelation. He's, he's already ascended out of the bottomless pit to go into perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is, even the, the world is going to marvel when they see this, this entity. I don't have time to stop, but I'll just tell you to go home and research that verse. Because there is a lot of theology uh, packed in that little verse where he says, where, whose names are not written in the book of life, from the foundation of the world. Remember a song that we sing? I don't know that we've sung it here, but there's a new name written 
in the in glory or something. How's that go, Miss Fran? There's a new name written. You don't. There's a new name written down in glory. According to this verse, that song's not biblical. Now that makes you stop and scratch your head a little bit as to how your name gets in the book of life when John just said it was put there before the foundation of the world. And you say, well, preacher, what are you saying? I, that's all I'm saying. That's what the scripture says right here. That's why you can go home and ponder that thought. But, but Paul addresses it a little bit in Romans chapter 9 where he says if God's already got everything figured out and done, why does he hold us accountable for how we live? And Paul said he just does. He still holds us accountable for what we do. So we're not puppets on a string. We are accountable to a sovereign God in how we live and which choice we take, the godly or the ungodly. That's what the whole Bible's about. I mean, how can you get away from that? The whole Bible's about which road you're taking, whether you're godly or ungodly. And yet, God don't hold you accountable for what he's already done in eternity past before you were ever even, even before anybody was ever born. That's just a marvelous subject, uh, tidbit that comes out of that. But let's carry on. Verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. Let's have some wisdom here. The seven heads or seven mountains on which the woman sits. So here's this woman, this great harlot that comes into view here riding on this beast, but also now we find that, that the seven heads of the beast are seven mountains on which the woman sits, so she's, she's in authority, powerful, ruling seven mountains, and there are also seven kings. And five have fallen, and one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Remember, I read this back earlier, and we went back to the book of Daniel, because Daniel's having similar vision as what John has here. And, and Daniel actually names four of the, the kings that, that we're talking about in the book of Daniel. So right here. Here's what I believe from what I can piece together, and certainly I'm not alone. Uh, many Bible scholars. We're looking at seven kings, five have fallen. As far as the biblical record goes, the five kings that we know about are Egypt, Assyria, because Assyria, while we don't hear a lot about it when we get past the, the times of the kings, Assyria was a world power at one time, and they are the ones that captured the ten northern tribes of, of Israel and disseminated them throughout the rest of the world. The ten tribes never came back to, to being. They, uh, Assyria uh, was that second king. Third one was, was Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian regime, which was a fierce uh, world power. And four, under Daniel, you had the, the Medes and the Persian, the uh, Persian kings under Iran, modern-day Iran. And then you had Alexander the Great to come in, the whole Greek empire that, that swept the world. So you had five world kingdoms up to this point that John is writing. And then he says, and one is, of course, that's Rome, and one is yet to come. And he's only on rule for a short time this three and a half years that he sets up his earthly kingdom as what we've been calling the Antichrist, he's going to rule in this time. So when we look at what Daniel saw and we look at what John is, is looking at here, it begins to fall into place as to what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the world system, the world government, the powers that be here on this earth. And we're talking about a woman, a harlot, that's riding that beast. And all through Scripture, she's always referred to as that, uh, that which is against God. She's, uh, she's, the, she's the religious part of the world today. Look at what religion does in our world. 
And the very two things, and we'll get to the second one, but the very two things we're taught from kindergarten almost on is you can't talk about politics and religion. That's exactly what John's telling us about right here. Because that's where all, it, if there wasn't religion in the world, there might not even be war in the world. That's how sad it is. Because all the different religions in the world and people fight and kill over their way is the only way. And if you don't agree, then we're going to come kill you. And that's what religion, that's, that's what the harlot is representing. Not just the power of the world, but she's really representing everything uh, against God. She is, the, she is following what Satan did in the garden. God may have said, but just enough to get them thinking about God and religion, but, but that's not really the way you want to go. That's not where you don't find peace and comfort uh, in, in the world. Yeah, you, you, need to do it, uh, you, need to, you need to do it my way is kind of what Satan was saying. So there's seven kings, and they represent the political aspect. And yet she's riding this beast that has uh, the seven uh, heads and the ten horns. And the beast, verse 11, the beast was not and is not, is himself also the eighth. Remember how that when we first saw this beast, one, it was as if one head uh, was, was dead and it came back to life. And, and that's only, if this is not the right interpretation, I don't have another one for why it says he's the, this one is the eighth. If indeed John just said there's five and there one is and there's one yet to come makes him the seventh, other than somehow he's going to represent what Jesus did, he's going to die and be resurrected by the power of Satan, and that's what's going to marvel, the world's going to marvel that this beast is both seventh and eighth, as what John is just telling. And the beast that was... Verse 11, and is not, is himself also the eighth, and is of the seven, and is going to perdition. In verse 12, the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, who have received no kingdom as yet. So these kings are not of the old seven. They're, they haven't received a kingdom yet. But they'll receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So, and we just touched on the Battle of Armageddon in chapter 16. Probably some uh, conglomerate of nations, ten nations, and there's a lot of different thought about who this will be, but out of the old uh, Soviet Union, Ezekiel talks about the cities of Gog and Magog. Those are, uh, those are Russian cities. And so somewhere out of this great communist bloc, is, is coming ten kings, ten nations, the European uh, nations that are going to assemble together, ten of them, and they'll have great power, and, and for, a, for an hour they're going to, to reign with the beast. And then in verse 13, they are, these are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. So he's going to set himself up as, as the world the world leader, and these ten nations are going to fall right in with him as they march against Israel, thus the Battle of Armageddon that we saw uh, last week. I mean, uh, that, that may be some conjecture, but it, it, it appears to be that that's what the, uh, there's something going on with these ten nations for sure, these ten kings, and they're giving their authority to the beast. In verse 14, and these will make war with the Lamb. That's the battle of Armageddon, the coming back of the Lord that we're going to get to in just the next few chapters. And the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. That's exactly how he's going to be referred to when he comes back. And those who are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. And then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So remember, brought that to your attention. We started out with the harlot, and then the kings, then all the people. And then we talked about this, this animal, this beast, seven heads, ten horns. So now he's, he's, now he's going back to that subject. He says, 
the waters that the, you saw where the harlot was sitting or all the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, and the ten horns which you saw on the beast. Now listen at this. These will hate the harlot. It starts out, looks like the harlot's in command. It looks like the harlot's riding in on the beast, and she's the authority. She's directing everything, and up until this point in time, she has. The great religions of the world have dictated much of the world's politics and, and, and what people think and do, and, but at this point, at the end of time, these, these kings, the world system, they now represent politics. The political system of the world is one day going to reject all religion. Islam, Hindu, it don't matter. They're going to reject it all because the Antichrist is going to say, there's no room for any other gods. I'm your God. And they're going to follow him. And that's where they come to Armageddon thinking, we can't lose. We, we're the whole world. And Jesus just shows up and just ruins their party. <laughs> Jesus just speaks, and it's all over. Because you go back in the Old Testament, and I've told this story before, but it's just so true when Jeremiah talks about, you go out and you cut a limb down off of a tree, and you bring that thing into your house, and half of it you cut up and you cook your, your morning meal over. And the other half, you carve yourself out of idol and put it up on the mantel and worship it. And he says, that's about as foolish as you can get, isn't it? To think that you can just create your own God and that God's don't tell you how to live your life. And that's just the two ways. Either we're, either we're going to follow God or we just don't make it up as we go. And this is the ultimate end of following the make it up as you go is that everything in the world now is where God had offered it for free, it's cost them everything to now worship the one God of the world. And that's the Antichrist. In verse 16, and the ten horns, the ten kings, which you saw on the beast, will hate the harlot and will make her desolate and naked and eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose. Boy, <laughs> we could stop and do some pondering on that. Why do it in the first place, God? <laughs> you know, we got talked about that in Sunday school this morning. Why, why didn't you just either not make Lucifer or kill him a long time ago? Because you don't banish him here. I mean, why didn't you just, why did you do what you're doing? But in every bit of this, God is still glorified in the fact that he is just and right and worthy to be worshipped. And everything that he's done has been perfect. And even the way it all culminates and ends, he's still going to be glorified and worshiped as being right and vindicated and being just. For God has put it into their hearts, just like he hardened Pharaoh's heart to not let Israel go until it was time. And then he let Israel go. God has put it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose and to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. There's always been two ways. There's two ways before us today. Even as Christians, there's still two ways. We can either, either read our Bibles and and be obedient to what Scripture says. Or we can still be the old man, as Paul talked about. There wouldn't be, there wouldn't be that uh, chance of us 
going back into sin, if it were for all the admonitions that we see in Scripture, we wouldn't have all those admonitions if we were just going to live perfect after we got saved. We're not going to live perfect. We still have the choice of either uh, following the ways of the world and thinking that we're going to find our, our contentment and our happiness and our peace and doing what everybody else is doing. And God's going to chasten us. Now, in fact, the only difference in us and the lost world is that God chastens us uh, if we're truly his Christian. If he's truly our father, he gives us a good spanking when we go out and live like the rest of the world. And in fact, I think a good way to know if you're really a Christian, if you can live like everybody else lived and live the way you live before you made a profession of faith and you never even feel the, the presence of God and him chastening you or him drawing you or him doing anything to you different than it ever was and you probably don't have the holy spirit of god living within you everything in the bible teaches me that god makes a difference in our lives and yes when we sin uh, and we will he'll forgive us if we'll come before him but he'll chasten us back to him now, Paul even goes to far as to say he turns some men over to satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit might be saved. They had just went the wrong way, the wrong way, the wrong way, and, and Paul just started praying, God, just, just touch them. Uh, not in a good way. Some pestilence, something. Touch them. Get their, do something to get their attention, lest they continue down a, a path that's going to cause even greater destruction. But the path that God wants us to follow is one of, Reading his word, praying, coming to church, just doing the things that he's told us to do. It's like any loving parent, grandparent. Sometimes you just have to tell them, because I said so. You know, just, just, I'm the parent and you're the child. Because raising a bunch of grandchildren, we can already see how uh, some are more strong-willed than others. We can already see they, they have their ideas about how they want to live their lives, and they're three years old, and they need some guidance. And so God treats us the, the same way. So powerful passage here this morning, I think, about the two ways. Some great imagery, I hope, gets our attention to realize that, that, that God does have a plan for his people, and if we'll just obey him, it's the greatest plan unimaginable, the unsearchable riches of Christ, Paul called them, uh, awaits us as his people when we follow him. Let's pray together.